Amen. So Acts chapter 18. So here we're starting. If you look at your map, um, Paul takes a little jump from Athens over um, to Corinth. If you look at your map, we just he heads across a little land bridge um, to the south of and the southernmost part of it looks like a little peninsula there um, in um, Macedonia or modern day um, Greece. So let's look at Acts chapter 18 and see what we can come up with um, this evening. We're only going to get a few in. Um, and explain something that happens in verse number 6. But let's look at things right away for sake of time and get moving. Verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, uh, born in Pontus, in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation, they were tent makers. So just a real quick um, side note right here. I mean, we see, this is kind of surprising. If you're reading Acts and you come to this point, um, you realize that um, there's, you know, Paul works. <laughs> Paul, Paul is uh, bivocational. All right, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I just want to make two quick points here before we get to the main um, meat of the sermon. But Paul, I mean, you think about all the things that Paul has gone through in the book of Acts so far, and here he is. He's supporting himself along the way. He's working as a tent maker um, as he's visiting um, these different cities, as he's you know, debating in the synagogues, as he's being chased from town to town to town by the Jews that he's upsetting. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. And then, you know, the whole time, though, he's working. He's working, and he's, he's, he's confirming the disciples, and he's starting churches, but he's working the whole time. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to make two points about that, all right? So he's a bivocational evangelist, I guess you could say. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The first point I want to make is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where the Bible says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. So I want to, I want to give you two points that, that Paul, um, working and supporting himself as he was an evangelist, two advantages that that gives him. All right, there's nothing wrong with a pastor being paid or being supported by the church, but to be bivocational, there's two advantages that Paul points out um, in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. I want to show that real quickly. So we see that Paul worked in Acts chapter 18. For yourselves, brethren, now he's writing to the church at Thessalonica, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. He's like, it was not for ourselves, it was not for our gain. Look what he says in verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before, we were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So what he's saying is, you know, I want you to know that we're not here for our own gain. As a matter of fact, you know, we're being, you know, treated badly is what he's saying. He's like everywhere we, I mean, no kidding. We're studying through the book of Acts. We see that Paul is not being treated well. He's being um, he's being shamefully entreated. He's being um, persecuted as he preaches the gospel. Now, I mean, personally, I mean, you can be a church member and have respect. A lot of people think like, okay, you know, the pastor, you know, he gets all the respect and all this kind of stuff. But here's the thing. You can be a good standing church member and have a lot of respect from both the pastor and your brothers and sisters in the church. You can be a very respectful person. The difference going into the ministry is the disrespect that you will receive. I'm not talking about anybody here, but I'm just saying, you know, just from a personal testimony, I have never been disrespected so much as when I went into the ministry. As a church member, you, you have the ability to have respect. Hey, just walk faithfully, just be a man of your word, just follow what the Bible says. People are going to respect you. I'm going to respect you, right? But the difference what Paul is saying here is like, look, we're shamefully treated. We're not here for ourselves. What could possibly be in it for us because we're just being abused everywhere we go, is basically what Paul's saying. Look at verse 3. He says, Our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. Not saying guile meaning slyness, trickiness. He's, not, he's like, we're just out here, and we're just like telling you how it is. Look at what he says in verse 4. But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time, look what he says, used we flattering words. So what he's saying is, we just came with the gospel. We came with the gospel. 
not to please men, just to just, we didn't come here to tell you how great you are. We didn't come here to flatter you. We just came here to tell you what God said. We just came here to preach the gospel. And then look what he says. As you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. So he's saying, we didn't come here to flatter you, and we didn't come here for your money, is what Paul said. Now look at verse number six. Nor of men sought we glory. He's like, we didn't even come here just to be like, hey, look at how great we are. He's like, we're, we're not here for vanity. We're not here for glory. Neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now what he's saying here, and Paul always kind of gives this caveat, he's saying, we may have been coming to you as, we may have come to you as the apostles of Christ. I mean, look, we're a pretty big deal, the apostles of Christ. You know, we could have come to you like that, but we didn't. He's saying, we could have been burdensome. We could have expected you to take care of us, is what he's saying. We could have expected you to provide for us. We could have expected you to, you know, you know give us sustenance and give us, you know, payment for whatever we were, for what we were preaching. He says, but instead, verse 7, we were gentle among you, and as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. He's like, we only did this because we care about you. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For, now, this is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 18. Laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. He's saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, they did the same thing there. He's saying, hey, we came there, and we weren't chargeable to any of you. We could have been, but we weren't. We weren't going to be a burden to any of you. We worked. And he's saying, the reason that he's saying that it was an advantage to them, a benefit to them, is so no one could say that they were greedy or covetous. Nobody could say that Paul came to preach to them to, you know, as a job, uh, you know, as a, uh, to, to make a, a money, is what he's saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look, this is what the Bible says that false prophets are all about. It's all about making money. You know, in, first, in Titus 1, in verse number 10, it says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially if they have the circumcision, the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake, saying they're doing it for money. So this is a big driver for, this is one of the main drivers of false prophets, even today. You say, why does, why does somebody get up, why does somebody like Joel Osteen get up and just, he just uses the name of Jesus to just, you know, uh, as, as a token, to get people into his, you know, prosperity church where he can sell books and he can tell people how great their life is going to be if, you know, they just come to his church and they give money. Why is he up for filthy lucre's sake? That's why. I mean, it's, look, it's not good for business when you run the church like God wants to run the church. Because that means, like, you know, people come in here that do certain things, they're going to be, you know, escorted out the door. That's not good for business. You know, false prophets, that's what it's all about, filthy lucre's sake. And Paul's saying, look, we weren't chargeable to you. We work day and night. You can't call us covetous. Like, there's, Paul is literally saying, he's such a great example because he's saying, like, there's literally nothing in this for me. He's like, all we care about is you, all right? Now I'll turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Here's the second reason. So the first reason is so nobody could accuse him of being, this is just an advantage. So this isn't to say that, you know, a pastor of, of a church that can afford to, you know, support a pastor shouldn't do so. Paul, but this is just an advantage that Paul had, is that he could say, you know what? Nobody could accuse me of doing this for the money, all right? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. So here we got a problem. Here we got a problem in this church where there's people that aren't doing, a brother saying there's men in this church that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. They're walking disorderly. In what way? And not after the tradition which he received of us. He's saying not after the example that we showed what is that example? Look at verse 7. For yourselves, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. So he's saying, you got some brothers in the church that aren't acting. Look, it doesn't say, he's not accusing them of not being a brother. He's just saying you got some brothers in the church that aren't acting the way we sh showed that they should act. He's like, because when we were there, he said, we did not walk this way. What's he talking about? Look at verse 8. 
He says, neither do we eat any man's bread for naught. And again, but we rot with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. So he's saying, and then look at verse number nine again. He says, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example to follow us. He's saying, not that we couldn't have done that. Not that it would have been wrong. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about how, you know, it's not wrong to pay a minister of the gospel. So he's just saying, we didn't give that example, though. And so the people in your church, the men in your church that aren't working, he's like, they need to get to work, is what he's saying. And he's, he's saying, so first of all, the first one is, so nobody could accuse him of being covetous. And the second one is, as an example. It's a good example of what? Of work ethic. So, you know, don't be so hard on a bivocational pastor because there's a couple good things there. You know, it's, a, it's an example of work ethic to the people of the church, particularly the men of the church. And it's also, you know, a, a proof that, you know, the, the pastor or the evangelist or whoever is not in it for the money. Okay? All right, Acts chapter 18. Let's go back and look at verse number four. That's just a, a side note. So, Paul, I mean, it's just, I, I still find that amazing. As you see, all the things, we've gone through that map, all the trouble Paul has had along the way. He's working day and night to support himself. You know, he's making a tent here and there, so he has some, he has some of his own bread to eat. All right, look at verse number 4 of Acts chapter 18. So he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And verse number six is where we're going to stop here. and We're really going to focus in on verse number six. And it says, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed. So here he's saying he's in the synagogues and he's reasoning. He's preaching Jesus to the Jews in the synagogues. But it says they opposed themselves, meaning they were contradicting themselves. They were saying one thing, and then he would, you know, use the Bible to, you know, prove that wrong, and then they would say something that contradicted what they said over here, and then they blasphemed. I mean, finally, he just got, you know, they were just talking, they were talking bad about Jesus, is what they were doing, all right? They blasphemed. He shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. That's a big moment right there. That is a big moment right there, and that is what I want to talk about tonight. I have preached through the book of Romans um, at the beginning of, you know, several years ago, but, and then I've kind of pieced some things together about the Jews, but I want to explain the, the significance of this statement and what is actually taking place in Acts chapter 18 regarding the Jews tonight. That's what I want to look at. Turn to Titus chapter 3 um, to start off. First of all, let me just, before we get into, you know, the Jews and Paul saying, you know, your blood be on your own heads, I am clean. Let's just look at Titus chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, first of all, Paul is acting biblically here. When he doesn't just stay there and just argue endlessly with people, Paul is acting very biblically here. Because the Bible says in Titus 3.10, it says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. That he, knowing, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. He's, he's condemning himself by arguing with the word of God. So you run into this soul winning. You run into it, we ran into it today. You run into it soul winning, and you're not to sit there and just give somebody, you know, Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse when they don't even believe the Bible in the first place. I mean, you're, the Bible here is saying, like, it's just, you're, it's wasting your time. So you give one Bible verse and an explanation. You give a second, you know, Bible verse and an explanation. And if people are like, yeah, I just don't believe that. Look, there's nothing you're going to do there. That's a heart problem. And us as people, you know, I mean, God fixes the heart. We don't fix the heart. Okay, so that's what Paul is doing. He's literally shaking the dust off his feet. He's just saying, look, you're opposing yourself. You're blaspheming the Lord. That's it. I mean, look, you're going to run into people where, you know, you say, you know, you know it's, it's by belief alone. It's by trusting in Jesus. It's not of works. And they're like, yeah, I understand that. But you have to do the works. I mean, you're going to run into people like this. And then you show them another verse. I mean, you could show, like, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of Bible verses that clearly show that salvation is not of works at all. 
It is only by belief, only by trusting. And then they're like, well, believe means, believe on means to turn from your sins. And you're just like, okay, then they're reinventing words. I mean, look, you're going to waste your time with these type of people. This is why Titus 3.10 is there. It's like after the first and second. Look, there's somebody down the street that wants to listen. There's somebody down the street whose heart is right. You're going to waste your time debating. This is where Paul got. He's like, hey, I'm not going to waste my time just endlessly debating you when you're contradicting yourselves. If you're clearly not accepting what the Word of God says, there's nothing I can do for you. You say, yeah, but that's sad that you can't convince those people. Well, turn to Ezekiel chapter 33 real quickly. But here's the thing. Paul says, I am clean. He says, I am clean. What does that mean? What did he mean by that? Where he said, I am clean. He said, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. Let me show you what that means. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 33, and I'll explain to you exactly what Paul was talking about. Ezekiel chapter 33 in verse number 2. So they're opposing themselves. They're not even making any sense. They're saying, yeah, I believe it's not of works, but it is of works. And they're saying, you know, the things that we've heard a hundred times, just not making logical sense. And Paul says, you know, I'm done here. You're blaspheming the Lord. I'm done. I am clean. Look at verse number two of Ezekiel chapter 33. The Bible says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, look at this, his blood shall be upon his own head. So here's the situation. Here's the analogy that the Bible is giving here. You know, the, the Bible says you have a city and the city chooses a watchman. And the watchman sits up on the tower and the watchman sees danger coming. And the watchman, he sees the danger coming and he does what he's supposed to do. He warns the people. He goes, doo -doo! and he blows the trumpet as loud as he can and everybody hears. Or at least this guy in verse number four hears and he's just like, yeah, I'm watching the game. He's like, ah, I'm cooking ramen noodles. You know, he's like, yeah, you know, I heard the trumpet, but, you know, I, I'm taking a nap or whatever, right? I mean, whatever the, the, the things that we hear a million times, but here's what we do when we're going up to the door, you know, hi, we're from Hold Fast Baptist Church. Da -da! That's what we're doing. We're being the watchman. We're being the watchman. And if people are like, ah, ah, and they knock your trumpet out of your hand. All right, I'm going to calm down here. Kids are getting me a little excited. The point is that if the watchman blows the trumpet and the people hear it but disregard it, it's their fault. That's what the Bible is saying. Now look at verse number five. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. This is exactly what Paul said to the Jews. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But, now here's the, here's the one that wasn't Paul, but if the watchman see the sword come and he's watching the game, it says, and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. All right, so this is the, this is the problem. The Christian who is saved today and goes and just hangs out with all his unsaved friends and unsaved family and isn't living anything of what the Bible says that he should be living, and he knows that the enemy is coming. He knows the danger that the unsaved are in. He knows, as John 3.36 says, that the wrath of God abideth on them. I mean, what kind of friend is that? That guy, it says, he's not going to be clean. Look, he's, he's going to lose rewards for that, is what the Bible is saying. All right? He's going to lose rewards for that. So, yes, we care. We want to pull people out of the fire. You know, we want to pull people out. But at the end of the day, it's not on us. If we go out and we warn, we blow that trumpet... And in these extreme cases like Paul, he's literally being chased from city to city. They're literally chasing him down, trying to kill him over and over and over again. Finally, he's like, hey, the blood's on your own head. He's like, I am clean. I have tried to warn you. And he says, from henceforth, I go to the Gentiles. 
Now this is a super important stage in, in the book of Acts, right here, where Paul says, from henceforth I go to the Gentiles. Go to Romans chapter 11. In order to understand this, we really need to do a verse-by-verse -verse study through Romans chapter 11. But it's interesting, while you're turning to Romans chapter 11, let me just read this for you. It's interesting that he said, you know, your blood be on your own head, because it seems that the Jews knew this. Because if you remember in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate, and the Jews want him killed, Pontius Pilate is like, he's like, he hasn't done anything wrong. And they're like, they're like, crucify him. They're like, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And the governor said, I'll read it to you. Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people, these were the Jews. They said, his blood be on us and our children. I kind of get chills every time I read that in the Bible. And that's exactly what Paul is repeating. He's saying, you know, your blood is going to be on you. I've tried to warn you. I am clean. All right? Now, look, the Jews, the Jews are completely misunderstood today. Completely, especially by Christianity, whatever that even means in our country today. But the Jews, first of all, it is not a race thing. We just, I just preached on racism last week there's one blood there's not many races there's one race the human race that's what the bible clearly teaches but again it's not even a genealogy thing jesus said you know forget about endless genealogies it means nothing it never has it's a religion that's what judaism is that's what it was then and that's what it is today it is just a religion look even modern day jews know this even modern-day Jews know this. It's just a religion. Being Jewish is, the, is, is being Muslim, being Buddhist. It's, it's, just an, it's just a religion is all it is. Let me, the Jews know this today. Let me, let me read to you how to immigrate to Israel. Okay? There's a way that you can immigrate. There's like basically one way to immigrate. Like say, I want to go and be an Israeli citizen and live in Israel today. It's called... Aliyah for Jewish immigrants. And it says this is what you have to do to go and be a citizen of Israel. It says any person born to a Jewish parent or those who have formally converted to Judaism can immigrate to Israel under a process known as Aliyah. As a Jewish person under the law of return, you can return to Israel and re receive all the rights of an Israeli citizen. So it says any person born to a Jewish parent, this is very similar. This is not genealogy. This is very similar to, you know, someone that says they're Catholic because their parents were Catholic. It's, it's a religion. You're identifying with a religion. That's all it is. So you were born to Jewish parents, or you did what? You converted. It, it doesn't say you have to be black, red, white, yellow. It doesn't say anything. It just says you have to convert to Judaism. That's it. Look, even the Jews know it's just a religion. It's just a religion. That is it. And look, I'm not even saying that it's wrong for them, for them to say you have to convert, you know, to our religion, you know, to come to our country. I'm, that's not even, I'm not even going there. The point is, the point is that it is a religion today. It's, it's completely misunderstood. Like if you say something against the Jews, you know, you're, you're racist. No, it, it's, you could say, okay, you're against that religion, but it's, it has nothing to do with race. Okay? So look. Go to Romans chapter 11, and I'm going to explain to you what happened in Acts chapter 18 with Paul saying, you know what, I'm going from henceforth, I go unto the Gentiles. That process is explained in Romans chapter 11, which guess who wrote Romans, by the way? Paul wrote Romans to the Romans after this situation with, you know, obviously it's for us, it's for everyone, but he wrote Romans after this situation in Acts chapter 18. Look at verse number one of Romans chapter 11, all right? Now, the, we're going to go through this verse by verse. So I'm going to explain all of this to you, all right? Because there's a lot of confusion today, but it is very simple when you just follow what the Bible says, all right? Look at verse number one. I say then, hath God cast away his people? You know, of course, he's talking about, he's talking about the Jews, God's people, all right? He's talking about the Jews here. Hath God cast away his people? 
God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So remember who, who was in Judah. Who were the tribes that were in Judah, by the way? The tribes that were in Judah were mainly Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. All right, there was really three tribes that were in Judah. Look at verse number two. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not that the scripture say, saith of Elias, how he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, talking about Elijah here, okay? Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. He's talking about Elijah when he was just, he was just like, everyone's against me, and I'm the last one. He's like, I'm the last one. First Kings chapter 19. Then God says to him, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. This is the famous showdown with Elijah, you know, but God is saying, look, it's not just you. And so we start out Romans chapter 11 saying, are, are all the Jews like not, I mean, because the majority of them rejected Christ. And, and Paul is saying like, what? Are all the Jews re rejected of Christ? And he's like, no, not all the Jews. And he compares it to how Elijah thought that there was nobody left that still worshiped the one true God. There was 7,000 men that had not bowed the knee. In the same way also, look at verse number five, even so, so this is a comparison. Even so, then at this present time, there also is a remnant, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. All right, now, what is the, uh, what is the, when we see the election, this is defining what the election means for us right here. It's the election of grace, meaning what? Those that believe. Those that believed on Christ. Okay, those that accepted the gospel that Paul was preaching. And if by grace, now verse number six is a, is a great verse. So what, what Paul is saying in verse number five, he's saying just like there was 7,000, even though Elijah thought there was none, just like it seems like most of the Jews rejected Christ, he said, there is a remnant, there is some. There is some that were of the election. What do you mean, the election like God just picked them? No, election of grace, meaning they believed. All right? Now look at verse number six. And this is just such a great verse showing that, you know, this is a great verse to just show people that like, there is no like, like grace plus works. There is no, oh, I'm saved by trusting on Jesus, but I still have to do these things or God will take it away from me. No, there is none of that. There's either grace there's works. That's it. And if you, if you want grace, there can be no work. What does that mean? That means you can't trust any work. Meaning if you're believing, if you believe Jesus died for you, but you also believe you have to do even one thing, no grace. And then the Bible says in Romans 4, 4, debt, that's what you have instead of grace. Look at verse number six. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. He's like, otherwise, you did it yourself. He's like, if you had to go, you know, pound your own nails into the house, he's like, you could claim, you could do what? You could boast, as Ephesians chapter 2 says. You could boast. You say, yeah, you know what? Jesus died for me, but I put in those four nails. I put in those four nails my, myself. But what people do is the house is completely built. The house is completely built. And God gives them, hey, here's a completely built structure. It's perfect. There's nothing else that needs to be done, and there's nothing missing. And you go up there, and you start pounding in all your own nails. No grace. That's what the Bible is saying here. All right? He's like, so he defines what grace means. Then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Look at verse number seven. What then? He says, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So it's saying some of them obtained it through what? Grace. And it says the rest of them were blinded. Look at verse number, skip down to verse number 11 for sake of time. It's, and he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? He says, God forbid. But here's where we get into Acts chapter 18 right here. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? So look, this nation, now you have to understand that he's talking about Israel, this nation. He's like, some achieved the election through grace. And he just keeps repeating that and repeating that throughout the chapter. And we'll, we'll all point that out. But he's like, some of them achieved, achieved the election through grace. He's like, others were blinded. Others were blinded, right? The remnant 
was the election. Others were blinded. He's like, what? Why? Have they stumbled that they should fall? He says, God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. You see that? He's saying, no, no, no. This was not for nothing. It's like, God, God can make anything good to those that love him, to those that are going to listen to the gospel, Romans 8, 28. So he's saying, yes, but through their fall, through their blindness, guess what? He's like, the Gentiles are, are getting saved. The Gentiles are going to get saved. And not only that, but that's going to provoke my people to jealousy. Because all the Jews are going to see all the Gentiles accepting the gospel, and they're going to be like, oh, man, it's going to provoke some of them to get saved too, out of jealousy. Look at verse number 12. This is where Paul, he's going to go, look, this isn't the last time that Paul talks to the Jews. But he starts focusing on the Gentiles, as he says in Acts chapter 18, and a good blessing that comes out of that for the Jews is that some of them will get saved because they're jealous that the Gentiles are coming to the Lord. Look at verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, meaning the fall of Israel, the fall of the majority of those that didn't believe is the riches of the world, meaning it's, the, it's a blessing to the Gentiles. So, Paul, this is what you're seeing. The fall of them be the riches of the world. Just write in your Bible, Acts chapter 18, verse 6, right there. The fall of them is the riches of the world. That's where Paul says, you know what? I'm done here. I'm going to the Gentiles. That's the fall of them was the riches of those Gentiles that Paul went to. And the diminishing of them, meaning as they get lower, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, now he's talking to the Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. He's like, you know what? I'm, I'm glad that I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Even though, look, Paul was a Jew. Paul was a Pharisee. If by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are my flesh. He's saying, look, I magnify my office to the Gentiles. I am happy to go, and I am joyful to go out and preach to the Gentiles if, by, if, if that helps my own people come to Christ, is what he is saying. And might save some of them. You know, that's... That's such a powerful statement right there because, look, we're going out, and, and if you're a soul winner, you know we go knock. We'll knock 200 doors. We'll knock 300 doors before, you know, we get three or four people saved. But we know we can't save them all, but you know what? We could save some. Paul knew, I, I, I'm not going to save the majority of these Jews, but I could save some. He's like, I, I'm not going to save them by, by preaching to them, but you know what? By, by just preaching to the Gentiles and having the Gentiles come and get saved and become part of church and become disciples of the Lord. He's like, you know what? That's going to provoke them to jealousy. And he's like, so I'm going to just push harder at this. Look at verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Look at verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And now we get into a really great analogy here. We get into a really great analogy about the Jews and about the Gentiles. Look at verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, these are the Jews that did not believe. And thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. What he's saying is, some, he's using the idea of grafting a tree. Look, in California, everybody understands this, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing, actually. You ever seen a tree that, like, grows, like, five different kinds of fruit? It's because they just, they take and they, excuse me, they take and they graft. They graft in, like, a, like an orange tree and a lemon tree and all these things in the tree. It, it, it grows from the same root, and, and all these different branches were grafted into this same tree. So it says some of the branches were broken off, and you were a wild olive tree. And you were grafted in, you know, amongst this good olive tree. He's saying, boast not against the branches. He's like, don't start getting all puffed up about that. He, he's kind of lecturing the Gentiles now. He's like, now you were grafted in, and you're just as, part, as much part of this tree as, as the original branches were. He's like, but they got cut off. Don't be like, you know, all proud and boasting against the branches that were cut off. 
It says, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. He's saying, just be happy that some you know, branches were broken off and that you know, I came to you, is what he's saying. <laughs> that's what he's saying. Since, since those branches were broken off, that's why Paul went to the Gentiles, right? Acts chapter 18, verse number 6 there. Because Paul got so frustrated, he said, I'm clean, I'm done. From henceforth, I go to the Gentiles. That's bringing the Gentiles in and grafting them in. So that is exactly what is happening in Acts chapter 18. Look at verse number 20. And he says, now, why were they broken off? And let's just recap. Why were they broken off and why were they grafted in? Now, verse number 20 is just a great verse to just explain again. It says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standeth by faith. So again, he's comparing the fact that they were, they were broken off because they didn't believe. And thou standest by faith. They believed. So believed, grafted in, didn't believe or unbelief, cut off. Be not high-minded, but fear. He's, look, it's not ethnicity. It's belief or unbelief. That's it. It is so simple. Look at verse number 21. Now he says, don't be high-minded, but fear. He's saying, remember what happened to the nation of Israel. He's saying, you Gentiles, as you got grafted in. Now, think he's talking, about, uh, he's talking to nations here. He's talking to groups of people here. If you apply this to individual salvation, you will be so confused, and it will contradict the Bible so many places. He is talking about the nation of Israel. He is talking about the nations of the Gentiles. He is talking about, you can even apply it to families and family trees. Okay, But he's saying, don't be high-minded. Don't think that you, you and your nation and your group are so great because you were grafted in. He's like, no, it was just belief or unbelief. That's it. Look at verse 21. He says, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed that he also, that lest he also spare not thee. This is not talking about losing individual salvation. All right. The Bible says in John 10, 20 and 8, it says, Jesus, said, Jesus himself says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. Eternal salvation is so clear in the Bible. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, you know, once you've trusted on Jesus, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. Everlasting life, eternal life. He's just talking about, he's saying, careful Gentile nation. He's like, because if you turn away, if you turn away from the Lord, he's like, you'll be cut off too. You'll be cut off too. I mean, there's so many nations like that. Let me think of an example right now. How about this one? America. America, a nation that used to have so many Bible-believing Christians, so many saved Christians, so many gospel-preaching churches, and now you, you can hardly find one. People that we know move all the way across the country to find a gospel-preaching church that has a King James Bible in their pulpit and that is going out and preaching the gospel. Look, you would think, look, th that used to be all over this country. But God is saying, hey, fear. Fear. You should fear, all right? God spared not the natural branches. <laughs> what do you think he's going to do if, if you turn away, all right? Not talking about individual salvation. Look at verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Kind of two sides of that coin, isn't there? How, how good God is to these Gentile nations that Paul would go and these Gentiles that, you know, they didn't have anything. They didn't have the oracles of God. They didn't have, you know, but look, God says there is no, neither Jew nor Greek. It means nothing to him. And so God is goodness. Jesus came and he died. He died for the sins of the world. Whosoever. But the severity of God, meaning God's wrath. You know, the Bible says that if you're not saved, you know, God's wrath abideth on you. God's wrath is on you. It says the goodness and severity of God on, on them which fell, severity. But so he's saying those which got cut off, it's severity. They're under God's wrath because they didn't believe. Unbelief, remember, he says, but towards the goodness. The gospel, what do they call that? The good news? If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Talking again about nations, families. Otherwise, that would just be straight up preaching works salvation. Right? So that's obviously not what he's talking about. He's talking about, he's talking about the whole context of this is Israel. Is Israel of Romans chapter 11. 
and they also. So here it is, proving that it's not a person, right? It says, and they also, if they abide not still in... Who's they? Who's they there? Israel. He says, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for it is God is able to graft them in again. The Bible here is saying, look, there's all this weird doctrine today, like how there's going to be this magical salvation for Israel. There's going to be this magical salvation for the Jews. Can, can Jews get saved? Yes. How can they get saved? If they believe. I mean, how many times does the Bible have to say it? It just says it again and again and again. It says, God is able to graft them in again if they abide still not in unbelief. Let me translate that for you, if they believe. So God is saying he can graft them in too if they believe. You, you know, on an individual basis or as a, you know, it's an individual thing to believe, folks. All right? He's able to graft them in again. But the Jews today, folks, that believe in the Jewish religion, they're broken off. They're broken off. Look at verse 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature in a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, like all these like, weird evangelists that aren't even saved, they use this one verse... And they say, see, God's going to graft in the Jews. Say, no, but look at verse 23. Yeah, he's going to graft them in if what? If they believe. I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but I mean, the Bible just keeps saying it over and over again. It's like, you either believe or you don't believe. I mean, this is not rocket surgery. I mean, it's believe or not believe. That's it. All of verse 24 is saying, for a Jew that believes, like, they're graft they'll just be grafted in. Because... God's able to graft them back in. Look at, you know, look at verse 25. There's nothing magical. There's nothing magical. There's going to be no magical salvation for a certain group of people. It's believe or not believe. Look at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Again, he's just saying, don't do the same thing that Israel did. Don't be all proud, being like, we're God's people. You know, he's telling the Gentiles, please don't be like that. Please don't be like, we're in the vine, we're in the tree, we're the olive tree, we're a branch, <laughs> you know, and don't be that, don't be like that, because then he's like, you're going to end up being cut off because your nation will fall into unbelief, you'll think you're so great, you fall into what, basically, what happens, you fall into works-based salvation, just like the Pharisees, that's what, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, all the Pharisees were preaching was works-based salvation, that's it, they were just preaching like, follow the law, look at how great we are, be like us, that's it. Look at verse 24. No, I'm sorry. Go to, uh, go to verse number 20. We're in verse number 25. Now, this is the big part. We're going to get into some prophecy here. It says that blindness, we continue. It says blindness in part is happened to Israel. Again, repeating this idea that blindness in part, most of them, has happened to Israel. And then it says this kind of this cryptic statement. It says until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And then all the John Haggies and people will say, see, there's going to be a point where God just magically saves them all. But they're all just going to like just wake up all of a sudden and just be like, I believe in Jesus. Right? They're going to see, you know, some, you know, something, their blindness is in when this, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Well, guess what? God tells us, the Bible tells us when the fullness of the Gentiles is. All right? Look, go to Luke chapter 21. But look, some believed, let me just finish, you turn to Luke chapter 21, blindness in part happened to Israel, some believe, we see this in Acts, we see this again and again and again in Acts, some believed, but most of them, the most powerful ones, were trying to kill Paul, trying to kill the apostles, right? Verse 26, I'm going to keep reading while you're turning to Luke 21, it says, and then here's another one, so the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved, this is where they get this magical salvation, right? When this fullness of the Gentiles happens, all Israel is going to be saved, right? Look, let's just go figure out what the fullness of the Gentiles means, and then maybe it'll lead us to understand what's happening here, right? As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So who's the, who's the deliverer out of Sion? That's Jesus, right? So it says Jesus is going to come. Let's go to Luke chapter 21 and see if we can find out what the fullness of the Gentiles is because it's significant all right luke chapter 21 now if you were here for the clues and milestones 
timeline of events. I'll try to recap it a little bit for you. I'm kind of running out of time here, but it's important that we get this, all right? You're in Luke chapter 21. Look at verse 23. The Bible says, now Luke chapter 21, again, talking about end times prophecy here. It says, but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And look at this. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Look at this. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the Bible here is saying is that this time at the end. So really the connection I need you to make here is that we see that the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled is connected to Jerusalem being trodden down of the Gentiles. All right. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 11. Go to Revelation. So we see. There's something significant that's going to happen to Israel when the fullness of the Gentiles has come. We see that the fullness of the Gentiles has come in Luke chapter 21 during this time of troddening down of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. All right, in Luke chapter 21. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 1. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. <coughs> But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto who? Unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. You divide forty-two by twelve, and you get three and a half years. Basically, what we're talking about here, you remember the sermon on the abomination of desolation. The abom we're talking about Daniel's 70th week. Daniel's 70th week starts with the Antichrist appearing and making that covenant with many. Remember that? Then he goes through this process. How does he get from the covenant with many to the covenant of the whole world in Revelation chapter 13? He goes through this process that's defined in Revelation chapter 6 of this world war and this terrible you know, war that kills a third of the earth. And then, he, look, he brings people into submission, and then there is a one world government that we read about, talking about the mark of the beast and all the things that we've studied out all detailed in Revelation chapter 13. But you remember, Revelation is laid out chapters 1 through 11 and chapters 12 through 22, parallel beside each other. So chapter 11 is towards the end. But we can see just by what's happening here, Jerusalem being trodden down by the Gentiles for 40 and 2 months. That is started, that 40 and 2 months is started by the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation where that Antichrist comes and he sets up the image. He sets up the image in Jerusalem, in the temple, and demands that people worship that image. And some, anybody that isn't going to worship that image and get the mark of the beast is going to be killed. And for 40 and two months, he troddens down Jerusalem. And what is happening in that second half of Daniel's 70th week? That is where God is pouring out his wrath on Jerusalem. Mankind. The rapture has already happened. Just a few days after the abomination of desolation is when Jesus comes and raptures the saints. After the great tribulation, the great tribulation starts when the abomination of desolation is set up. That mark of the beast is given, and he's just after everybody. He's just hunting everybody. Who's got not, not have the mark? They can't buy or sell. Find him. He's hunting them. And the Bible says it gets so bad that if God didn't shorten it through the rapture, nobody would have made it. It's so bad. All right, that's all in Matthew 24, not to re-preach that. But the point is, is that starting at the abomination of desolation, which is basically at the beginning of the, of the seven-year period of Daniel's 70th week, or at the middle, it's, it's a little bit before the middle, but it's basically at the midpoint for our purposes. For 42 months, the Gentiles are going to trodden down Jerusalem while God is pouring out the, the trumpets and the vials of his wrath on the earth. So it's for three and a half years, and at the end of that, Luke 21 tells us that the full, that's the fullness of the Gentiles. At the end of that three and a half years, when that troddening down of Jerusalem, the Gentiles, that's the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. When that troddening down is over. All right? Now, let me just ask you this. We'll see your Bible knowledge. What comes after Daniel's 70th week? What's right after that? Right after that, after Daniel's 70th week, after God is done pouring out his wrath, you know, Babylon is destroyed, you have the Battle of Armageddon where Jesus comes back with who? Everybody. 
He comes back and he destroys everybody. And then what happens? It's the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus literally rules and reigns on this earth for a thousand years. That's what happens right after Daniel's 70th week. So he's saying, basically he's saying all Israel shall be saved at the end of God's wrath at the end of that week. That's what he's saying. Now go to, um, go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Go to Matthew chapter 19. Now look, I mean, God sends those two witnesses, not to, not to preach all of the second half of Daniel's 70th week, but God sends the two witnesses. There's going to be people that get saved during God's wrath. But guess what? You know, they're going to, they're going to be in the millennial reign as well. Go to Matthew chapter 19 and look at verse number 28. So you say, how does that mean all Israel is going to be saved? Well, look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 28. The Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, what? In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He is talking to the disciples here. He is saying, when I come back, when we all come, look, there's going to be a regeneration. We're going to have, you know, our glorified bodies. We're going to be regenerated, and that's what we are going to be. That's the state we're going to be in in the millennial reign of Christ. And here he's telling the, the disciples that they are going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel, meaning they're going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. Who are the 12 tribes of Israel? These are the Old Testament saints that were resurrected at the rapture that are coming back with Jesus to reign on this earth. The disciples are going to be in charge of those areas. Look, how many believers died between Abraham all the way up to Christ? I mean, millions. Millions and millions and millions of people. These are the people that are, look, they're going to be the regeneration along with us. It's going to be the resurrected saints during the millennial reign, folks, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the, the Old Testament saints. People were saved in the Old Testament the same way they're saved in the New Testament. All the same people. There's no, and guess what? Nowhere in the Bible will you find a magical salvation. That's why this, this oh, when they see Jesus coming on, on the horse, coming back for the battle, they're all going to look up and they're going to believe. No. Jesus was saying, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said, this was to bend the whole problem with the Jews. It's like they, they, they constantly require a sign. It's like the Greeks, you know, the Greeks seek after wisdom. And Paul says, you're too superstitious. But the Jews wanted a sign. But you know what Paul says? He said, we preach Christ crucified. That's the sign. That's the only sign. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the sign. And look, he's saying if you didn't believe Moses, you didn't, you, you, there's nothing that you could see. That, that There's no sign. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. With, what was Paul preaching? He was preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look, they're going to get saved by believing. Who? Everybody. Everybody that believes on Jesus is going to get saved. It doesn't matter who you are, what religion you're from, if you trust on Jesus... You're saved. There is no other way in the Bible anywhere. It's, look, it's complicated. You listen to some of these. these and look, I'm not, I, I don't even really think the pre-trib, you know, versus, you know, post-trib, you know, pre-wrath is that big of a deal amongst Christians. But the problem is with the pre-trib stuff is it, is it always leads into this weird, magical salvation of the Jews stuff. Which, you know who that's a, you know, you know who that's a, you say, this is, this is mean. Well, here's, you know who that, that is a disservice to? The Jews. We don't hate the Jews. We want the Jews to be saved, just like everybody else. I mean, that, because that is the only way that it's going to happen. Go back to Romans chapter 11, verse number 28. Romans chapter 11, verse 28, it says, and as concerning the gospel... Just, he says it again. It's concerning the gospel. There Again, he's talking to the Romans. He's talking to the Gentiles. He was saying, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. 
for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He's saying, look, I, I don't change my mind about having Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. as Because look, they were chosen. They were, they were chosen for a specific you know, purpose of you know, being the patriarchs of you know, the children of Israel. And look, God loves unsaved people too. God wants all, you know, some unsaved people. God doesn't love everybody. That's a sermon for another time. But unless they get saved, eventually they are going to, they are going to suffer God's wrath in hell. That, and that's everybody. So you say, I mean, now we have this doctrine today, like this weird doctrine of that we are like this Judeo-Christian country. And I'm just like, what does that even mean? Because you literally, because look, my view is this. You know, people have asked me before, you know, are the Jews cursed? Are the Jews cursed? You know, by, because they said, his blood be on our head and on our children. Look, here's how, anybody, here's how cursed anybody is, that they don't believe on Jesus. That's a curse. And if you are in some religion or some belief system that has hardened your heart against the gospel, yeah, I, I'd call that a curse. You call it what you want, but it's going to send you to hell if you can't get past that in your heart. But here's how I look at it, and here, this has been my experience giving the gospel to, you know, around the world. My experience has been the further somebody's belief system when you come up to them, the further that belief system is from the truth, the harder it will be for them to get saved. That, I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, you think of somebody who's, you know, a Muslim. They're not, they're not even, they're not Christian, uh, you know, but look, we've seen Muslims saved. We've seen Muslims saved. You know, but what do they believe about Jesus? Well, they don't believe he was God, but they believe he was a good man. They believe he was a prophet. They believe he was from God. Okay, you know, that's not where they need to be, but it's not, you know, they don't believe bad of Jesus. Just, you know, if you think about that. Now you believe about, like, a Buddhist. They, they just don't even believe in Jesus at all. So, yeah, it's a little harder there. Because it, it's a further bridge to cross. This has been my experience. Now you just take the Jews. What do they believe? They believe Jesus was a heretic. They believe that he was a liar. They believe that his mother was basically a, a promiscuous woman. They believe that Jesus is currently burning in hell in excrement. That's what they believe about Jesus. Of all the religions, they believe the worst about Jesus. This is why it's so hard to get Jews saved. I have never had, look, maybe somebody else has, but I have never had uh, uh, someone who is Jewish even let me open my Bible to them. Because they have the problem that Paul is warning against the Gentiles in Romans chapter 11. He's saying, just because you're grafted in, he's like, don't you get a big head about it. Don't you get high-minded about it. And you, you walk up to somebody with a Bible and say, I'd love to share the Word of God with you, and they're like, I, I'm God's people. What are you talking about? Look, that's a disservice to them. That's a religion that is a long bridge to cross to get to Jesus Christ, to get to their Savior that they must trust in. It's a long bridge to cross. So, yeah, I mean, I don't even like replacement theology, the, the words, because, like, basically... I mean, all I mean, the Bible teaches that it's not that the Gentiles replace the Jews. It's that believers replace the nation of Israel. That's it. And some of those believers were Jews. Some of those believers were Gentiles. Most Jews, you know, there was a remnant of Jews that believed. So I don't even like replacement theology because it's just such this doctrine of it's just believe or not believe, no matter where you came from, who your parents were, what your genealogy is, is so clear in the Bible, it is ridiculous that people can miss it. I mean, this weird doctrine of some different salvation for other people, I mean, Jesus says in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Nobody. Nobody. No man. So look, you know, he's, he's just warning the Gentiles in Romans chapter 11 of getting the same arrogance that the Jews had, that were God's people. Like, would God, would God send his people to hell? Every single, that does, every single person that doesn't believe and dies is going to go to hell. That's, that's just as simple. It's, it's belief and it's unbelief. That's all it is. That's all it's ever been. All right? So Paul is going off to the Gentiles, and hopefully that makes sense of, you know, he's heading off to the Gentiles. It's not that he's never going to talk to Jews again in Acts, 
But he's heading off to the Gentiles, and he's going to magnify that position, he says, for hopes that he'll provoke some of those people to salvation. And look, that should be our prayer for the Jews today, is that you know, they are provoked to salvation. That should be our prayer for anybody today, is that they are provoked to salvation. Because that's it. That's what the goal is. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.